Over the last few weeks, I have been sent a lot of TikToks of people hacking different things. Things ranging from Dave & Buster's game machines to gas station price signs. Now, most of these TikToks are fake. People are just doing it for clout on the internet. But some of them, some of them are very real. And this got me thinking, if someone can pick up a Flipper Zero and a little bit of training can start to open up people's garage doors and emulating certain car keys, what can the world's superpowers do? What can countries like the United States, China, Russia, and North Korea do? And, and to be honest, the more that I looked into this topic, I started to ask myself, is cyber warfare a thing? And if it is, what does the battlefield look like? So strap in, I am going to take you down the rabbit hole that is the hidden battlefield that's unfolding right before our very eyes. It's the late 1940s, and life? Life is good. Germany and Japan have surrendered, and World War II has come to an end. For most, life was improving, and world peace was looking up. At least, that was until it happened. In the August of 1949, the Soviet Union had held a test. A test that would change the world forever. With the split of a few atoms, the Soviet Union had just thrust itself into the atomic age alongside the United States. This test would supercharge and spark a rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union that would last decades. Ever since then, countries with atomic weapon capability have avoided a full-on direct war with each other. In fact, it's always been in an indirect war, or a war with stipulations. For example, something like the Ukraine and Russia. Now, although the United States is not physically fighting the Russians in the Ukraine, we're still sending billions of dollars of weapons and aid to the Ukraine to help fight Russia as a proxy. Small asterisk here, uh, we send weapons and aid, uh, but we also send Brad Paisley. Checkmate, NATO. Anyway, depending on the way you look at the current geopolitical situation, an all-out war between two nuclear-capable countries could be in the future. Now, I don't say this because I'm some doom and gloom person, but because of the interesting times that we live in. For the first time in history, we could enter a war not because of borders or trade routes being destroyed, but because someone hacked another country and destroyed infrastructure. But I think it's more likely we're going to end up, as it, well, if we end up in a war, a real shooting war with a major power, it's going to be as a consequence of a cyber breach of great consequence. There are many types of cyber warfare, but in this episode, I want to focus on cyber attacks that are cyber physical. Cyber physical warfare is defined as a security breach in cyberspace that has impacts on the physical environment. Essentially, it's when you hack into a computer, and because of that hack, something in the real world is damaged. For example, it could be electrical grids, it could be dams, it could be hospitals, it could be pipelines. You get the point. Cyber warfare had to start somewhere, right? It just didn't poof into existence. So who opened Pandora's box? It all started in Iran. During 2009, Iran was secretly refining uranium to potentially go into their nuclear reactors. But a lot of countries did not believe that Iran was going to use this weapon-grade uranium to be used for nuclear energy. And in fact, a lot of countries believed that it was going to be used for nuclear weapons. Now, I'm not going to say what countries believe this. <coughs> The United States, the United Kingdom, and France presented detailed evidence to the IAEA demonstrating that the Islamic Republic of Iran has been building a covert uranium enrichment facility near Qom. In response to Iran creating this nuclear facility, there was a joint partnership between the United States and Israel codenamed the Olympic Games. In this joint operation, a computer virus was made. Its name was Stuxnet. The Stuxnet was made and dropped into Iran, and it was so good at infecting computers 
that cyber analysts believe that in 2009, over 58.9% of all the computers in Iran had this virus on it. To put this into perspective, Iran in 2009 had the population of California and Texas combined. Now, just imagine if all the computers in these two states, just over half of them, just had a virus. Just out of nowhere, just had a virus and no one knew what it did, but they knew it was good at disseminating itself. And the way that the Suxnet code worked was utterly genius. During this time, Iran had 14 facilities housing and operating over 9,000 centrifuges. Anyway, small explainer on centrifuges and nuclear refinement, uh, without getting the old bad boys from the Department of Energy on me, is that centrifuges are used for refining uranium. So you get the uranium ore out of the ground. Well, what do you do with it? You refine it to be usable in these nuclear reactors. So then you place it in what's called a centrifuge. And a centrifuge basically just spins it real fast until you get the uranium-235 that you need to put in the nuclear facilities. Anyway, the Stuxnet team knew that if there were centrifuges refining uranium, that there must be some large computer controller controlling how fast these centrifuges spin. And when the virus found what it was looking for in one of these Iranian nuclear facilities, it began silently turning up the speed of the centrifuges up and down, all while completely displaying false numbers. And the virus did this so that they could break the facility and the refinement process at these facilities right underneath the noses of the engineers. It is currently believed that Stuxnet destroyed up to 900 centrifuges with this one attack. Higher up officials of the United States government saw this as a total win, but little did they know that a similar exploit could and would be used against us in the future. United States and Israel opened Pandora's box to cyber warfare and it will never be closed again. Hey guys, Cole from the future here. Um, so the first half of this video was recorded while I was feeling great. Um, and then about two weeks later, I finally got around to recording the second half. Um, I went to an aerospace medicine conference, got sick. So that's why I sound like shit. And I apologize. Anyway, back to the video. With the kickoff of government backtacking groups, it, it got me thinking. What have other countries been up to? I mean, obviously the United States and the Israelis can't be the only ones doing this. Or are they? And my research led me to one of the United States' biggest adversaries, Russia. The Russians have embraced the cyber-physical attack probably more so than anyone, becoming one of the biggest perpetrators of cyber-physical warfare. This leads us to the GRU. The GRU is the Russian military's intelligence division. Inside the GRU are many classified units with a wide range of abilities, but the two groups that we want to focus on today are Fancy Bear and Sandworm. Fancy Bear and Sandworm are very different in their approaches whenever it comes to cyber attacks, but both focus their attacks on Russia's Western adversaries. And I know what you're thinking, Cole, why do I really care about a government hack? No, in fact, both of these units are known to target more than just governments. They're responsible for attacking private industry corporations and world trade infrastructure, costing private industry and American taxpayers billions in damage. Unit 7455, AKA Sandworm. Sandworm is a Russian military intelligence unit that is tasked with creating cyber chaos in the West. The Sandworm group was given this alias because in one of their malware attacks, one of the coders had put a reference to the book Dune by Frank Hebert into the code. And to be honest, their name is pretty accurate. Like the worms in Doom, the hacking group hides out of sight, out of mind, mostly untraceable, at least until it surfaces. <laughs> and when they surface, they fuck shit up and leave behind extreme amounts of wreckage. Sandworm was first recognized in 2014 by cybersecurity company iSight Partners. And what iSight found was really interesting. It was a piece of malware called Black Energy. Initially, cybersecurity analysts thought Black Energy was just a malware being used to spy on Western countries' infrastructure, but no one really knew for sure what it did. In the December of 2015, Sandworm's boldest hack to date happened. Ukrainian power facilities were hit with a massive attack, causing a blackout in the frigid Ukrainian winter. This one attack put hundreds of thousands of lives at stake. And the way that Sandworm shut down the power facilities was frightening. It was meant to send a message. 
Sandworm had three aspects to their cyber attack. First, destruction. Sandworm began wiping the power facilities, just computer hard drives, or outright breaking their computer systems. Second, panic and chaos. During the chaos, Sandworm began barraging the power facilities with thousands of phone calls in order to add to the chaos and essentially make their telecoms basically useless. Third, darkness. Sandworm, using black energy, gained access to the power facilities and turned off both the power and reserve power systems at these power stations. So everyone, including the power facilities, were thrust into darkness. The most frightening part about this attack is how Sandworm took over the power facility's computer systems. When Sandworm hacked in using black energy, they completely took full control, full access, and locked out the operators. So they literally could not do anything with their computers. All the operators could do was sit in fear and watch their mouse that they no longer can control anymore slowly go down and click and turn off every single power system to the facility. This one hack left an estimated 225,000 people without power in the frigid Ukrainian winter. Now, thankfully, after a few hours, the power was restored. This is because the power facility that was hit had physical switches that could be turned on and off by the power station operators. For many security analysts, this was a huge, unprecedented shock because for the first time ever, government-backed hackers were now targeting and attacking civilians of another country. <laughs> and I can speak with very high confidence that I and the rest of the world don't want to see Putin's big worm anywhere near our infrastructure. And as an American, I did not even hear about these cyber attacks in Ukraine's power facilities. And I'm not alone. I've asked around and a lot of Americans did not hear about this event happening either. And I think it's because we were focused on an entirely different major Russian cyber attack, APT-28, AKA Fancy Bear. In 2015, the Democratic Party of the United States was hacked by a Russian intelligence group called Fancy Bear. In this hack, Fancy Bear gained access to the internal documents from the Democrat Party's servers, basically capturing the secret plan that the Democrats were going to use to get their current presidential candidate, Hillary Clinton, to presidency. With these documents in hand, Fancy Bear then turned around and leaked the documents to the press, hoping to sway the 2016 election from Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump. Fancy Bear has been a very successful hacking group, but it really isn't known for cyber-physical attacks like Sandworm is. There is one thing they both share in common, Ukraine. Ukraine has been used by the Russians as like a cyber warfare playground. This is where both Fancy Bear and Sandworm would practice cyber attack after cyber attack, slowly developing their cyber weapons to be potentially used and unleashed on Russia's other enemies. And on top of Russia's number one enemy list, is the United States. The United States has two different divisions that focus on cyber warfare. One is the NSA, and the other one is US Cyber Command. From my understanding, the NSA hasn't really been found responsible for any solo cyber physical attacks against foreign countries. Now, I'm not saying that they haven't done any. I just couldn't find any during my research. But what is publicly known about the NSA though, is that the NSA spent billions of dollars creating a Windows exploit called Eternal Blue. And Eternal Blue was a really, really powerful Windows exploit. It could do a lot of damage in the wrong hands. <laughs> yeah, and um, Eternal Blue got leaked on the deep web and then almost immediately picked up by the Russians to be used in their NotPetya malware. And this NotPetya malware was then taken and used against the Ukraine and other European companies. So, great one, you guys. Nailed it, NSA. Now, the US Cyber Command is a bit of a different story. Although most Cyber Command's operations are classified, there are two known cyber physical attacks done by the US Cyber Command. The first one is the Stuxnet operation that we mentioned earlier that opened Pandora's box to cyber physical warfare entirely. But there is a second. The second was a joint operation called Joint Task Force Ares. Ares was compromised of the US Cyber Command and the NSA. And uh, in 2015, the United States government realized that the ISIS terrorist group was um, exploding onto scene. 
Anyway, they were using the internet to weaponize and grow their operation. Now, thankfully, Task Force Ares decided to step in and curtail ISIS plans for the internet. Task Force Ares did this by identifying 10 prominent servers of the ISIS propaganda team, then began phishing and stealing passwords, deleting files, and breaking servers. Till this day, Task Force Ares still holds secret operations curtailing ISIS's plans. One attack that the US Task Force Ares reportedly still uses is rapid phone draining attacks. This attack drains the cell phones of the ISIS terrorist group, gives them less of an opportunity to turn the internet into a weapon. When I started writing this video, I debated on whether or not I should leave out China. And the reason I debated it is because China, China is the exact inverse of Russia. Russia's hacking groups are prone to hacking to destroy Western infrastructure, which is what this entire cyber physical warfare video is about. China is different. China is about espionage and lurking in the shadows, stealing as much of their adversaries, intellectual property, and data as possible. But I changed my mind whenever Microsoft dropped this blog post about a government-backed Chinese hacking group called Volt Typhoon. In this blog post, Microsoft goes into detail on how Volt Typhoon hacked into important United States computer infrastructure. Now, Microsoft never says the intentions of Volt Typhoon. They only point out what they did and how they did it. But Microsoft makes it very clear in their hacking methods that Volt Typhoon could have been used to damage lots of computer infrastructure. And what terrifies me about this hack is that the computer infrastructure that was affected the most, that we know of, was Guam. Now for most people, Guam is just an island in the Pacific, but Guam is actually a very important military island for the United States. If China is able to destroy the US military's computer infrastructure in Guam, this could hinder our ability to respond to China if they were to invade Taiwan. The country of Taiwan is central to our economy and our entire way of life in the United States. Why, you ask? There are massive computer companies, such as TSMC, that run a thing called chip fabs. These chip fabs produce almost all of the silicon processors that run in the technology you rely on every single day. Imagine if you were not able to buy a car, a toaster, a new phone, a new laptop, pretty much everything you know runs on silicon chips that these large chip fabs in Taiwan produce. This hack that Volt Typhoon did could have been used to cripple the United States entirely, and that terrified me. Thankfully, Microsoft caught the Volt Typhoon hack, and they're working on ways to patch the exploits they used to get in. North Korea. North Korea hasn't done massive cyber physical attacks like the United States or Russia, but they have become notorious in their own rights. As laid out in today's indictment, North Korea's operatives, using keyboards rather than guns, stealing digital wallets of cryptocurrency instead of stacks of cash, have become the world's leading bank robbers. This took me by surprise, especially since the country is so hidden and cut off from the Western world. The hack that North Korea is probably most famous for is the Sony hack. In 2014, North Korea-backed hackers hacked Sony motion pictures, causing millions in damages and forcing Sony to completely redo their computer infrastructure. Now, I can hear you asking, why would North Korea want to hack a Japanese movie company? It doesn't really make any sense. Well, Seth Rogen is why. In 2014, Seth Rogen and James Franco made a movie called The Interview, making fun of North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. And how did the North Korean government respond? Completely rationally. <laughs> no, that's actually not how they responded at all. The North Koreans decided to hack Sony and steal emails, 40,000 people's social security numbers, addresses and info of all the Hollywood elites. Uh, North Korea also deleted and damaged a lot of uh, Sony's hard drives and computer server infrastructure, forcing Sony to rebuild its entire computer network. So, you know, that was a logical response. So what does this mean for our future? 
How will the cyber warfare battleground affect our entire digital and physical lives? No one really knows for sure. The list currently showing on your screen is a frequently updated list of known attacks by nation states, and cyber attacks of any kind are becoming more and more frequent each day. But don't worry, we aren't defenseless. There are many brilliant men and women working around the clock to keep our computers and lives safe. This is why from a security standpoint, always update your software when available. These updates you receive can protect you and your computer from potential exploits and malware. And that's it. I don't have a sponsor. If you like the content, leave a comment on what you would like to see next. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. You're beautiful in your own way, and thank you so much for watching.